Good Tuesday, everybody. Welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast. Plenty of things to get to, but before we do it, got a special thanks to our friends at Exterior Home Solutions, thanking them for all that they do for us. We talk about roofing with Exterior Home Solutions, but they do a lot more than just roofing and Exterior Home Solutions. They can do siding, they can do windows, uh, they can do fence. You need a new fence, whatever the case is, at Exterior Home Solutions, they will take care of you. For a free estimate, give them a call at 865 524 Five eight eight eight, or check them out online at exteriorhomesolutions.com. Austin Price is with me now. We got a, all around the map on this podcast today. We'll get a hoops update from um, Rob and um, Grant Ramey coming up in a little bit. We'll get a full baseball update from the weekend in Dallas as well with Eric Kane. But we start with football and Austin Price. Tennessee has a new running backs coach, a replacement for Jerry Mack. Yeah, that's right. Darrell Sims, uh, you know, who is uh, – Coming from Cincinnati, um, he, he's kind of been a climber. Um, you know, has, has been some different places. He's been to Western Carolina. He was at James Madison. Most recently, he was at Cincinnati this past year with Scott Satterfield. Before that, was with Satterfield at Louisville and uh, Eastern Carolina. Before that, so you know, um, again, a guy who's got some ties to the Carolinas, South Carolina native hubs. His recruiting ties are, are probably the Carolinas and Georgia, which I know. Recruiting uh, North Carolina and South Carolina is important to this staff. Why do you think he was the right fit? They obviously interviewed some quality candidates when you look at the list of guys that Tennessee visited with. Why do you think Sims ended up being the right fit for this staff? I, I think it's just, you know, combination mesh and and, and, and just kind of, you know, recruiting areas, recruiting ties. Um, you know, you know why, why was he the fit over some of the other guys they interviewed? You know, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but for whatever reason, Tennessee felt like this was the direction to go. And, you know, you look back a couple of years ago, I think a lot of people questioned the Jerry Mack hire and Jerry Mack proved to be a really good football coach here. Um, you know, so I, I, I told you, you know, before these hires were ever made, I said, what I've learned is, is you can't judge, you know, hires until the guy gets here because, you know, sometimes they've never had the opportunity. Sometimes they've never, you know, you know, had the resources at, at other schools and, you know, uh, we'll see what kind of relationship builder he is. We'll see what kind of recruiter he is. Um, having spoke with him, he seems like a really good human being and uh, one that I think will connect well, uh, you know, with the players on this team. Uh, interesting. He actually is familiar with East Tennessee. He spent a year in Jefferson city, right. And, and trying to get established in the, in the coaching, in the coaching world as a very young um, as a very young coach who was working at Carson Newman and working with the, with the video coordinator, right? That's right. He worked at Carson Newman, um, you know, for one year and, uh, and then, and then kind of started to kind of build himself up from there. But that was when he was in his twenties. I mean, he's 38 years old now. He's been, you know, several different spots over the last decade. And, you know, I think it continues to climb and, and this will be his first, you know, SEC gig. But I mean, again, he was in the ACC for three years before, uh, being at Cincinnati this past year when Satterfield made the move from Louisville to Cincinnati. So um, I think, you know, gets gets the relationship piece in this. Um, you know, he, he he and several other running backs coaches are kind of on like a daily uh, prayer chain type thing. I mean, this is a guy who, who, you know, wears his faith on his sleeve and, and you know, again, just seems like a, a, a kind of a common sense, uh, you know, kind of guy to me having, again, having a, had a you know, brief conversation or two with him. He, he seems like a, you know, just kind of a guy that, you know, gets it. Yep. Less than four weeks till spring practice starts for Tennessee. Got to quickly learn this offense. Got to quickly learn his personnel. But he inherits a pretty talented room, Austin. Um, what do you see out of the running backs? And, and what is he getting when he walks into this offense and walks into this room of tailbacks? Well, obviously, Dylan Sampson's the leader in the room. Uh, the kid was on the leadership council as a sophomore. Uh, from there, you know, you, you've got Cam Selden, who, who is, will be a sophomore this fall. Uh, Dylan Sampson, of course, is a, will be a junior. Um, you know, Cam Selden's got all the talent in the world, bigger back, physical, um, a lot of high hopes for him. Khalifa Keith, another bigger back. Uh, this will be a big spring for him, I think, just because, you know, with Peyton Lewis out due to a couple of cleanup procedures, he needs to take advantage of that and try to lock down that number three spot because if he doesn't, you look at Peyton Lewis coming in and falling to Sean Bishop, those guys will be uh, chomping at the bit to try to, you know, to wrestle that away from him. So, again, I, I think that it's it's a – I would not call it an old room. You know, last year was an older room, right? Jalen Wright was older. Obviously, Jabari Small was older. Um, but what it is is, is I, I think it's a talented room. 
And uh, again, I don't think you have to have, you know, four and five year guys in the running back room. I think you are, uh, you can be very comfortable um, with the guys they have, but again, get through spring. We'll see what they decide. Do they need to go to the portal and try to add an older guy or not? I don't think they will, but again, I think this spring will uh, tell the tale on that. Yep. A busy few weeks for Darrell Sims. Who's got to get himself to Rocky top, get acclimated with this offense and get acclimated with the room that he inherits and get to spring practice with them. As Tennessee has their new running backs coach, a replacement for Jerry Mack in Cincinnati's Darrell Sims. Austin, busy time for Tennessee in terms of filling out their roster on the coaching side of things. Darrell Sims, the new running backs coach at Tennessee. Tim Banks had an opening when Brian Jean-Marie left to go to Michigan. Tim Banks wanted to go fast. He's went really quickly here in finding his replacement for Brian Jean-Marie. Yeah, he, he worked it hard all weekend long. And, uh, you know, to, to have this one done early in the week, you know, I think is a testament to kind of where Tim Banks fills things uh, are with the process and kind of where he wanted to go. William Inge, uh, who's you know been defensive coordinator at Fresno State, co-defensive coordinator at Washington the last couple of years, um, was supposed to go to Alabama, um, you know, as the uh, linebackers coach for Kalen DeBoer, is not going with him. He's decided to uh, join the staff at Tennessee under, under Coach Banks. And so he's an older veteran coach. He's 50 years old. Um, all of his ties are really kind of – north and west he doesn't have a lot of ties to the south now that would be the one kind of question i have is you know how does it relate to recruiting but again if you can recruit you can recruit in most places if you're a relationship builder you can recruit most places i've not spoken to coach in so i don't know what kind of uh, you know kind of personality he has what kind of relationship builder he is but you know I, from a football standpoint he has been successful uh, you know, he did a really nice job with the defense at Fresno State when he was there. Obviously, Washington, you know, has had a really good defense the last couple of years, and he's been an integral part in that. So, you know, again, I think the Coach Banks wanted to go somewhat fast, wanted a veteran, wanted kind of somebody to be his right-hand man the way B.J. was, and um, it looks like he's found his guy. Yeah, interesting in, in this one here, it, you start looking and, look, and looking, and it's hard to find ties, right? It's hard to find – how do they know each other? Where does this come from? I, I know Coach Inge was at San Diego State. He was hired there by Chuck Long. Chuck Long and Josh Heupel know each other. But I, I think this was Tim Banks working it all week long, work, yes. work, weekend long, long working his candidates. Not sure where the real tie, where they've crossed paths somewhere along the way, but clearly they have. He's got ties to the Big Ten. Banks was obviously in the Big Ten at Penn State. He was at Indiana. Coach Inge was. Maybe there's a tie there, but it, it they haven't worked together in the past that I can find, right? 100%. They've not worked together in the past. And, and you know, th maybe was there a month crossover between when Inge left Cincinnati and when Banks came in? I mean, they, they basically were back-to-back -back seasons. So, but, again, like even that's a little bit far-fetched. I mean, how much yeah. how much can you really build a relationship in, you know, three or four weeks? Uh, but they've never been the same spot at the same time. Um, you know, I do know this. Coaches – when they go against other coaches, you know, or, you know, even if it's defense versus defense, they they can see and, and respect, you know, what a coach does. Um, they, they may have seen each other out on the recruiting trail. Uh, either way, uh, you know, Coach Banks wanted to, to get a guy who has experience um, and has been productive and has, and has had his units, be, you know, be productive. And it certainly looks like he's got that in William Inge. Yeah, and and again, the the Rolodex for Tim Banks is deep, having been in a lot of places since 1997, 98. They're about the same age. It would only make sense that they know some some mutual acquaintances along the way that, that would have helped them get to know each other at conventions or skull sessions somewhere or, or whatever the case may be. Um, William Inge inherits a really nice linebacker group, Austin, when you look at what they've got coming back. He's got a veteran in Keenan Peely. Um, he's got a talented young guy in Arian Carter, Jeremiah T. Lander, pretty solid linebacker room, but a room of linebackers that probably have had their world rocked the last four or five days, right? With, with the news of Brian Jean-Marie leaving, um, that's going to be kind of interesting getting to know and getting settled in there because, because BJ was really popular with those guys. He was, and it wasn't just the linebackers. You know, BJ was very popular uh, across the football team. And so, you know, again, you know, Coach Inge, much like Coach Sims at running back, will have to hit the ground running. You know, they've got a couple of weeks here before spring break hits. 
But even then, I think they'll need that week to kind of get their footing, understanding the terminology, learning the defense, learning who you have in your room, what that person's skill set and what that person brings to the table. All of those things they'll have to kind of find out in short order because this new NFL window is causing the college window to remain open deeper into February slash March, which means quicker turnarounds for teams in spring practice. I mean, you look at, you know, Georgia State, when they lost their head coach, they were in spring practice and have had to do a pause on spring practice because, you know, they had their coach, John Elliott, go to South Carolina. So the the, the window is different now than it's been um, in previous years, and I think everybody's having to adjust. Yeah, no doubt. And Caleb DeBoer today is looking for a linebacker's coach because he thought that Coach Inge was going to join him in Tuscaloosa. It was reported by everybody that he, that he well, was going to Alabama. Look, look at – if you look at, at that Alabama staff, you had an O-line coach, an OC, and now a linebacker's coach, all of which were slated to go and then either got there and, and, and you know, kind of didn't about face or got there and ended up elsewhere. I had – that's hard because all of a sudden now DeBoer's still filling out his staff, you know, um, four to six weeks after he was hired, and which is odd based off the fact that you know he was bringing a lot of people with him, you know. Yeah. So it, it's it's a uh, it's an ever evolving domino effect um, with uh, you know not just the NFL but also the college coaching calendar. Yep, as the window stays open longer than it ever has. But for Tennessee's head coach Josh Heupel, his two position openings have been filled, and he's done it in short order. In just a, a little over a week's time, uh, he, has, he has put his full staff back together and in his full steam ahead for Tennessee for spring practice. When we come back, we'll talk some basketball here on the VolQuest.com podcast. You know, life happens, and damage to your home can be extremely stressful. That's why it's important to find someone who offers efficient, quality work with financing options. Exterior Home Solutions, they value not only family, but community. And they're who I call when life happens, and you should too. Thanks to our good friends at Exterior Home Solutions for all your exterior home needs. Be sure and check them out. We continue to thank them and appreciate them for their support of VolQuest.com. Let's talk, to, talk a little basketball now. The Tennessee basketball team took care of business in a big way this weekend, got help across the board in the SEC. Grant Ramey, Rob Lewis uh, joining me to talk a little hoops. Guys, uh, let's first talk about Tennessee's play. Was that as complete as we've seen Tennessee play against Vanderbilt? Now, I, I know it's Vanderbilt, but in terms of 40 minutes of complete basketball, was that as complete as we've seen Tennessee? Well, man, I mean, I'll throw both games from last week in there. Um, you know, I mean, Arkansas, I guess, did, was pretty good offensively the first half. I mean, ten, you know, Tennessee won those two games by 64 points combined. And, and no, they're not very good. I think they're what, five and probably five and 19 or something in the SEC, but still. You know, sixty plus points and you know a spread in, in two games and in, in league play in February. I mean, that, that's pretty impressive. I mean, I'm and again, I'm not trying to say that those those two teams are world beaters, but Tennessee's level of execution last week on both ends of the court was impressive. And what's funny is it coming. What we're a week removed from probably their worst forty minutes of basketball of the season at Texas A and M. So for them to turn around and have the second half they had at Arkansas. And then I do think that was the best, most dominant, lopsided 40 minutes of basketball they've played in terms of what they did against Vanderbilt because they came out of the gate hitting everything. They continued uh, through that first half offensively, didn't miss a beat. They're great defensively. Uh, Vandy barely got to 20 points at halftime since he had, what, 51. And, and there was no lulls in that game, and it felt like it was everybody on the floor was contributing. It wasn't Dalton going for 39. It wasn't Dalton and. Jonas, you know, combining for 60, it was, you know, whatever. It was, I think the highest was Dalton and Zakai with 14 points. And then Joe had 13 and Santi had 12 or something like that. And Jonas had 11 and eight. They were hitting threes. And I mean, season highs and assists, season highs and threes, 33 points off turnover, some crazy number like that. Had a ton of transition points. That was the best, most dominant, most complete 40 minutes we've seen from this group. And yeah, Vandy's bad, but. Vandy played with them for 20 minutes in Nashville, and they, they took, Tennessee took over in the second half there. Uh, but it was just a completely different story uh, the other night in Knoxville. Is this just as simple as this team making shots early and it changes everything for this basketball team as opposed to when they come out of the gate and they miss their first 
three or four threes like they did at Texas A&M. They got open looks, but they didn't go down. It's just just a simple point of last week they made shots to start the game. No, I don't think it's just that simple. I mean, Texas A&M, you know, also you know undressed them on, on the other end of the floor too with you know get the way they got to the rim and, and and attacked them with their guards. But I mean, obviously that helps. I think it really helps more on the road. Um, if you can get it, not not that necessarily start off unconscious like Tennessee did against Vanderbilt, but if you can just you know not start off as cold as ice like they did at Texas A&M, I think it's easier to kind of you know get yourself back in a groove when you're at home. But I, I do think there's probably something to that uh, when you're on the road. But also, you know, if you're if you're a veteran team that that has as much evidence that of what d- your defense can do for you. I would like to think, or I'm sure Coach Barnes would like to think that that would be a little bit minimized that you were so reliant on, on getting a few to go down. But that's also, you know, the nature of the game. Over it, just it just is. I mean, momentum and and um, you know, getting a little pep in your step when when it's going good on offense, and 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 that uh, that is a big part of it. Again, I think it's bigger on the road. Grant, I've never seen basketball. I mean, I've followed it a long time. I, I don't know that I've seen what we're watching right now. I mean, four teams, I think, ahead of Tennessee in the rankings lost over the weekend. Uh, I mean, it, it is – it's hard. And, and that's that's a credit to the game, but but it's it's hard. There are, there are no roll them out there type games. It doesn't feel like, right? I mean, this is a Vanderbilt team that beat Texas A&M on their home floor, got blown out by Tennessee, and their coach got fired. Right. Right. I mean, it, 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 why is it this way? Why is, is has basketball been like this and we just feel it more because there's all this talk about Tennessee being a one seed and they got a chance to win the, the regular season and they're jockeying here and there. Is that a different feel? Has it always been this way or is it really that different this year? Um, it, it feels a little different this year. I think it's a little different because of the transfer portal and because more teams have more access to talent, basically, that you can call up from lower divisions or or whatever, and, and kind of fill out rosters better that way and, and plug holes that you know that you need to plug. But, I mean, there's no better example than Saturday afternoon. They released the top 16 seeds for the NCAA tournament, the current top 16 seeds, and the number one overall seed is Purdue. And 12, uh, 24 hours later, they go to Ohio State, who just fired Chris Holtman, who's you know playing with some assistant coaches, the, the acting head coach, and, and Ohio State beats Purdue. And that's just Purdue's third loss of the season. I mean, I think that speaks volumes to – it doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter who you play. If you don't show up, I mean, Tennessee, y'all are talking about slow starts and fast starts. Tennessee goes 0 for 7, I think, in the first four minutes against South Carolina, and that whole game is off track, and you get uh, kind of, you know, an embarrassed at home in a whatever it was loss. I can't remember how many points Tennessee scored, but it was uh, their lowest scoring output of the season. They played South Carolina, dictated the game and all that stuff. Like, in South Carolina, is, they're tough, but we've seen them also kind of come down to earth here. Uh, losing by 40 at Auburn and then losing at home to LSU on Saturday. So uh, that tells you that any team can go anywhere. I mean, Missouri's lost 12 straight or whatever it is, 0-12 in SEC play. It, at some point, they're going to win a basketball game. You're just going to have to hope that you're not that team that's on the other side of the ball when, when that happens. And Tennessee's going to have to go there Tuesday and, and, and play well and, and, and just get another road win uh, like they did against a, a bad Arkansas team. But it does feel like it doesn't matter who you play where you play. Um, if you don't come out and, and play good basketball, you can get beat. Rob, does that make it harder or easier for coaches to get players' attention? Because, I mean, listen, every fan every fan out there is going, Tennessee will win tonight. I mean, Missouri's terrible. They're not going to – I mean, they're not, they're not going to lose this game. Missouri's terrible. Is that is that something that, as a coaching staff, you have to fight? Are kids savvy enough to see what all is going on in basketball to know you, you got to show up every night? That doesn't mean you're going to win every night, but you can't just – Hey, we're better. We'll take care of business. If this is a lay down type deal. Now, I, I think kids are savvy enough, especially veterans, especially you know like Josiah's, your guys like Zakai, um, you know that that have been around, played in this league, and you know lost, you know lost some games. I'm, I'm sure they, um, you know, regret not not because they necessarily took guys light, took teams lightly, but I, I think they've been around the block enough to where they're they're not not taking. Taking it like Missouri zero and twelve. I mean, what Missouri do to them last year? I know the team's changed, yes. changed a lot, but I, I'm sure that, that that's still going to matter to 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 these guys who are back. So when you look at Saturday a little bit further, nobody played more than twenty five minutes. Um, how important is that when you're trying to manage legs? Uh, this time of year, or are managing legs overrated this time of year? I mean, these guys 
been grinding, been going, and 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 they've got their regimen. Do, do you know? Do guys really run out of legs in college athletics anymore? I mean, was it a big deal that Zakai only played twenty four minutes as opposed to thirty four minutes? I think it is, and and credit Rob, he he leaned over with about fourteen minutes left because Don Connect checked out. And he put a towel around his neck, and Rob said, if that's me, that's it for Dalton Connect. Like, he's not coming back in the game because it's like 35, 40-point lead, whatever it was. We all knew, he was, kinda, we all knew he was going to get another rotation, right? It's the Rick Well, Rob yeah, I, <laughs> I kind of laughed at Rob like, no, Rick's not going to empty the bench this early because I could count on the number – I could count on two hands the number of times in nine years that he's truly emptied the bench uh, and, and, and let it go that early in the game. I think it's a big deal because Dalton had played 34 uh, – 34 or more minutes, like something like six times in the last 10 games. And, and Zakai's had a heavy uh, workload all season. And anytime you can get those guys, and, and Rick said after the game, he's a big rhythm guy. He doesn't want to break rhythm. He wants to kind of establish that rhythm in the season and, and roll with it all the way through. But I think it is a big deal. If you can get a chance to only play Dalton Connect 22 minutes, I think that's great. I think the same for Josiah. I think the same for Santi. Uh, for Zakai coming off the, the knee injury that he had last year. Anytime you can take advantage of an opportunity to rest those guys this late in the season and not have to worry about a game getting away from you, I think you got to take advantage of it. I think it's big for those uh, those young guys, too, that got to play some extended minutes and, and not just get out there for three minutes and that's it. And and for Rick to also praise those young guys the way he did after the game, saying saying they played it the right way, Rob. We don't hear very many of those kind of compliments no. from Rick. No, I mean, I thought it was I, – I, I thought the young – young kids get to play like, like Grant said more than just three minutes. I mean, they actually got to go into a timeout huddle, you know, after they'd been out right. you know, on the court for, you know, four minutes and, you know, get, get coached up a little bit that way. So I, I mean, that's the kind of thing that could come back to, to help you if you have a sprained ankle in, in, in Nashville in the SEC tournament or something and Cam Carr has to play 12 minutes one night or, or something like that. So I, I think that's significant. Also, and, and Rick Barnes would never say this, I bet you one reason that Dalton Connect and all those guys that played the last 10 minutes, Rick Barnes likes Jerry Stackhouse a lot. I bet you – uh, he wouldn't say that in a million years, but I bet you that's one thing – what are the factors in his decision on Saturday? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he didn't want to embarrass him and, and, and knew where – had a pretty good feel for where things were with, with Coach Stackhouse. And it would be interesting to see where Jerry Stackhouse lands next. Um I joked to somebody that maybe he's an analyst on Tennessee staff at, at some point in time here because th those two really do – they really do like each other. Now I think Jerry Stackhouse wants to go on and be a head coach somewhere and, and continue his coaching tree. But um, they're, they're, for whatever reason, those two guys have, have a great amount of respect for each other. I'll say this too, and, and maybe I'm wrong here, that, that, I mean, you don't rest those guys 22, 24 minutes if those, if those young guys go out there and – look like the bad news bears because Rick would have oh, yeah. thrown some people back in the game. So, I mean, credit those guys, not just for getting the minutes, but playing the way Rick wants to play. Cause otherwise he'd have got mad and, and Zakai would have went back in and, and got to run a, a point if they couldn't get the ball up the court. Right. I mean, 100%. It, I mean, so give them credit for realizing, Hey, this is crazy. We got a window with 10 minutes to go in a game here. We better, we better take advantage of it. Cam Carr certainly <laughs> took, took advantage of it with his jump shooting prowess, but um, you know they, they did play with, with, within the system there. The other guy who showed up in this game, who played well, uh, that, that I want to get your take on is, is Santi. Um, and, and just from a standpoint, I thought he looked more like the catch and shoot guy. Um, there was not there, there wasn't the head fakes, you know. There was I mean, if it was open, he was shooting. It was maybe I'm putting too much stock into it. Um, but it felt like it was a little different. Like he was jump shot hunting a little bit more than we have seen the last few weeks. Fair, or not fair. I mean, I don't have any data to back it up, Grant, but I, I just, you know, Hubbard, you asked about getting the one to go down early. I think it's important for him individually right now. Maybe not so much Tennessee as a team, but I, th I mean, he splashed one on you know the, the second or third possession. And to me, he just looked, more ready to pull the trigger, Hubbard, like, like you're talking about, more of a catch-and-shoot guy. Just, you know, I don't know if you know, his, his head coach has really finally got the message through, but he just looked, like I say, more, more ready to, to, to rock and fire. He's been too hesitant. I think he is extremely unselfish, and I think it comes from a good place. And he's those head fakes you're talking about, Hubbard, and the drives. Sometimes good stuff happens when he drives. But I think more often than not, if, if he catches and shoots it, good stuff happens there too, especially like Rob said, if he makes an early one, if he sees an early one go down. I mean, you go back and watch those Duke highlights from the second round last year, he was hitting some ridiculous shots. And they they need him to be that guy. I don't think they 
have to have him be that guy every single night. I don't think there's going to be nights where it's Josiah sitting shots, Santi sitting shots, Ganey sitting shots, where it's just everybody because that's just not really how basketball works. There's, really, there's always going to be somebody that's, that's not hitting that night. Um, but they need him to be that guy, and I think they need him to be a little bit more selfish at times and, and seek his shot and, and not to be so hesitant and, and take it because – uh, if he can go four for five, that completely changes that game and, and that Tennessee offense in that game. All right, Tennessee's got Missouri tonight, struggling team. And then you look at what's in front of Tennessee with that schedule. And then you look at where the standings are. I mean, it's literally all in front of Tennessee right now. What What do you like about this team? Not just the Vanderbilt game, but what do you like about this team the last week or so? Big body, big picture. What do you like about where they are when you talk about Texas A&M coming to town, Auburn coming to town, Kentucky coming to town, a trip to Alabama, a trip to South Carolina, what do you like about where this team has kind of positioned themselves at right now? I, I like the balance scoring, if you if what we've seen since. I mean, the Dalton Connect show was a lot of fun to watch, um, you know, when he was going for 30-plus points a game during that, during that stretch. But t- Tennessee is a lot better, and, and they're very obviously a lot better offensively when it's spread around. Um when they've gotten four or five guys in, in double figures, they're, they're averaging 90 points a game in SEC play. They never got there once when Dalton was, you know, going for 30 plus. They never topped 85 when in any games where Dalton was was 30 plus. So I, I think them realizing in in, in, the, in the staff really harping on it because I, I think it, I, Grant, I don't know, but you, I think it snuck up on the coaching staff that it was so Dalton centric all of a sudden. I mean, I'm not. I mean, everybody knew he was really good, but I don't think anybody thought he was going to be scoring you know, 32 points a game and they were going to have one other guy with 10 plus. Yeah. And, and me and you, Rob, we talked about it on fast break the other night, like he can give you 39 against Florida and carry you to a win, but they're at their best when, when Dalton's playing well, but Jonas is also playing well and, and he's a double, double guy or Zakai is playing well. Uh, and he's a key he can be a double, double guy as well with points and assists or Josiah's hitting shots or Ganey scoring off the bench. It doesn't have to be five guys in double figures. But if they got three primary guys playing well, I think it makes this team different. Um, what I like about them in terms of going down the stretch, uh, they got embarrassed a week ago at Texas A&M, and this team has kind of felt like they play well for a few weeks, and then they kind of need to get humbled and, and get kind of that setback, that w- whether it's Mississippi State, whether it's South Carolina, Texas A&M, whatever. And they got some help on Saturday too with, with uh, Kentucky going to Auburn and winning. And LSU going to South Carolina and coming back from down whatever it was, 15, 16 in the second half to win that game because they're only a half game back of Alabama uh, in the standings. They're, uh, I'm sorry, a game back, a half game ahead of Auburn um, and South Carolina. So that's big. You get Auburn at home. Uh, you got to go to Alabama uh, in a couple weeks. That's going to be really, really tough. You got to go to South Carolina. You got Kentucky coming here for senior day, March 9th. So uh, they're going to need some help. They're going to have to find a way to win a tough road game there in that final two week stretch. Uh, but at the same time, Alabama still has to go to Kentucky. And, you know, Alabama's got, I think, uh, two games with Florida still left. Florida's playing pretty well right now. So um, it's a good thing you're in that top four and you're, 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 um, that double buy you're trying to get in the SEC tournament. That's huge. Um, and Tennessee could still win this thing depending on how Tennessee plays and, and how Alabama goes from here. How important is winning the regular season championship? I mean, I, I don't know that that is very important. Important, you know, I think it's important to your fans, but I, I just think, you know, a byproduct is you with Tennessee's schedule. I mean, it's going to help you with seeding. I mean, if Tennessee, I mean, if Tennessee wins this thing, they're going to have, you know, they got to be one seed, right? I, I would, I mean, I'm just looking at it. I, I mean, even if you lose to Alabama, you pick up another win over Kentucky, um, you know, you're going to get a good win. You have a good win over Auburn. I, I would, it, you know, it depends on what else happens out there, obviously, but I, I, it, you're certainly right there. I mean, this league, this we haven't talked about. This league is is vastly, vastly improved. Is that what tra- it was? Is that transfer portal? Is that coaching? Is I that, think coaching is is that schools playing harder competition in the preseason so nobody's stacking twelve meaningless wins? You know, um, and 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 they played real competition and, and that's made them better. I mean, what what do you attribute it to? Rob, you say coaching. I think the biggest thing is coaching, but also you know you have to you know go behind the scenes and there's, there's had to been some. I, I think there's been an emphasis from from Greg Sankey in the last decade to athletic directors to you know to to not not necessarily lean on them is probably a strong word, but hey, you know let's let's make some hires, let's spend some money in that direction. And I mean the product is it, 
is just wildly improved. It's it's can, night and day. Can they get ten, Grant? Can it, can they get ten in the tournament? Is that a stre- is that too much? Um, Ray Barnes doesn't get ten or eleven. <laughs> Rick Barnes he's, has never he's shot been away from Harvard for ten for 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 nine years. I yeah. mean, Jimmy Jimmy Dice has Vanderbilt last four out. I think. <laughs> he's going to have fourteen or sixteen in here in a couple of weeks. I think they could, depending on how it goes from here. Um, but I do think the league's uh, as in as good of a place as it's been in a long time. I do think it's coaching. I do think it's investments. Uh, I mean, you look at Rick Barnes, what he's done at Tennessee, it's as good a spot Tennessee's been in a long, long, long time. Alabama with Nate Oates is as good a spot they've been in in a long, long, long time. Missouri was good last year. Uh, South Carolina's much improved this year. Auburn with Bruce has always been good. Kentucky still could figure it out. I wouldn't want to be kind of – I don't know. I just still – I think they're very dangerous. I think you saw that at Auburn Saturday night. So in terms of and, – and Florida too. The, the Florida team that played Knoxville has not been the Florida team that's played the last – three, four weeks. I mean, they're playing a lot better basketball than they were earlier in the season. It seems like they're maybe figuring it out. So I think it's it's investment and it's depth across the board. It's it's not just a top heavy league. It's it's tough night in and night out in this league. I mean even Georgia, I mean they're uh, four and eight in the league. I mean they had Alabama and Tennessee both dead, I mean dead to rights home, in, yeah. late in the second half at home. I swear I swear I I've turned on Georgia games like ten times this year. They're all home games. It's all sold out crowds. And they're down seven with three minutes left after being up ten in the first yeah. half. Like I, don't, I don't know what Georgia's got to do, but they've been there. They just hadn't closed. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, the difference between them and Florida is Florida's been able to find a way to close the last yes four or five weeks, and out and, and Georgia's not been able to close. They've both been kind of the same team for about 30, 32 minutes. Florida's found a way to finish it off the last eight, and Georgia has not. And, and otherwise, I mean. A pretty pretty similar teams. It, it is it is interesting to watch this league and fun to watch this league be as competitive and, and as good as it is night in and night out. It's I don't know that we've ever seen it that the way it, the way it is right now. And as a result of that, you better bring it every night. Tennessee's got to bring it tonight against Missouri and then put themselves in a position to be back home against Texas A and M and then that gauntlet of a schedule in front of them to finish it out. That could determine a championship. Certainly double by in the tournament. Uh, seating in the big tournament as well. Lots in front of Tennessee. We'll cover it all for you at VolQuest.com. Coming up next, we'll get you an update on baseball. That's with Eric Kane right here on the VolQuest podcast. Your roof, it's the most important protection against nature for your home or your business. That's why I trust the experts at Exterior Home Solutions. Be sure to give our good friends at Exterior Home Solutions a call for all of your exterior home needs, whether it's windows, siding, roofing, whatever, they can take care of you at Exterior Home Solutions. Everybody's looking for those spring renovations. Nobody to better handle that than the good folks at Exterior Home Solutions. We thank them for their continued support of VolQuest. Joined now by Eric Kane from, I guess not parts unknown. He's known where he's at in Dallas, Texas, and ready to make his way back to Knoxville, Tennessee after Tennessee uh, plays baseball this weekend, kicks off the season in grand style. Uh, didn't get to sweep, Eric, but they went two and one. Um, there was plenty of highlights, you know, some disappointment along the way. Give me your big picture take of Tony Vitello's version of this team to start the season. Yeah, I think it was a really productive weekend. Um, you didn't win all three games. You certainly could have. Um, you know, Tennessee left men on base. Tennessee was 0 for 3 with runner with with the bases loaded this weekend. And, and that's frustrating, but <clears throat> you did a lot of good stuff too. Uh pitching was was pretty daggone good all, all three games. It's not going to be perfect, but it was it was pretty good. Um your lineup in, in two of the games looked really, really solid, like the lineup that you thought it was going to be kind of coming into the season. And, you know, you had a ranked win on Friday. Saturday's loss, you know, Tony Vitello, I asked him, I was like, what can your team learn from this? And is it good to have a loss like this on opening weekend that can maybe teach you some lessons down the line? He said, hey, this was a regional game. The atmosphere, the type of game where it was low scoring, good pitching, um, literally every pitch matters. I mean, this is a regional game. So I think that you can take a lot from that loss to Oklahoma in extra innings and, you know, as you as you continue on throughout the season. And then the way Tennessee responded, losing that game, a late game, extra inning loss, falling behind quickly by a couple of runs on Sunday, coming back, taking the lead, losing that lead, and then coming back and just slugfesting your way to Sunday night. 
thought it was a really, really good response for Tennessee. So um, overall, I thought it was a really productive weekend. Uh, a lot of new faces made their Tennessee debuts known, and they did a really good job in that regard. And um, I would say mission accomplished this weekend. Now you come back for a pair of midweeks and a lot of non-conference games before the SEC schedule begins in a month. Yeah, first of all, shout out to the Tennessee fan base who was there. I mean, what what a what a heck of a crowd for February baseball and, and you know in, in another time zone in Dallas, Texas. Uh, pretty impressive, not just family uh, and friends there, but but some Tennessee fans uh, checking it out down there, which was really cool to see uh, when, when you watched it on the stream and everything. So shout out to them. You mentioned some things to work on now that you move into the the non conference portion where you're not playing a bunch of ranked teams. How much, how much more experimenting? How close is Tony Vitello to setting a lineup? What, what do you think that he takes from this that says, "Hey, maybe we're better here than I thought we were going to be," or "Man, we got to work here," or maybe we need to look at doing this or doing that? Or is it way too early to say that because you've played 27 innings of baseball? I think it's way too early to have anything set in stone, anything definite. If that makes sense, but. I mean, he's going to continue to tinker a little bit. You saw the order of the lineup switch a little bit for Sunday's game. Dylan Drolly moved up to the two hole. Uh, Blake Burke moved down to seven. You know, I, I, I like Hunter Ensley as a two. I would love to see Dylan Drolling as a leadoff. I think that's something we'll see before too long. So I think you'll see him continue to tinker with the order of the lineup. And, you know, that's normal throughout the season. Um, as far as who's out there to start position wise, I mean, it is what it is. Cannon Peebles, I think, and I said this going into the weekend, and it turned out to be pretty much what I said, what I thought at least. You know, on a normal three-game weekend, three-game series weekend, Cannon Peebles is going to catch two games. He's going to DH the other one. Cal Stark's going to get a start. And that's what happened, and Cal Stark was really good behind the plate against Oklahoma. And even at the plate, I think he was 0 for 3 or whatever, but he hit the ball really hard a couple of times. So, um, you know, I, I think that's going to be normal going through, but Cannon Peebles' bat's going to be in the order um, pretty much every game. I think Kavaris Tears is going to be your starting right fielder, but, you know, once out of every three or four games, you're going to see Reese Chapman get a start. And then I think you're going to see experimenting with Robin Villanueva and, and Dalton Bargo in pinch hit and in designated hitter opportunities. So, you know, baseball is never, especially college baseball, a lot of times you don't have a set in stone roster. You go by matchups, platoon splits, all that and more. And I think Tennessee will continue to kind of navigate through those waters. But overall, you know, the guys that are out there on the field are going to stay. And then depending on the injury situation at shortstop, that will determine kind of how much longer Christian Moore stays at short or – Maybe he stays at short. He looked like he, uh, you know, felt right at home there this week. He made a couple of nice plays. Yeah, I thought, you know, to me that was one of the biggest things that stood out about this weekend. I thought this team's fielding was really was really good. Oh, yeah. I thought they made a ton of plays. Uh, something that you know they needed to improve upon from a year ago, and, and I thought that showed up um, all, all weekend long. I thought they were really started solid for a group that was, you know, they were mixed and match in the middle infield and and. You had some newcomers out there who had played other places but hadn't played with this team. I, I thought, to, to me, that was my biggest takeaway is that this team has a chance to be a really solid fielding baseball team. I, I could agree more. You know, one of my takes on on uh, on Saturday night, and it's unfortunate because it's kind of overshadowed because of the, you know, leaving runners on base and losing an extra innings, but the defense was just phenomenal. I'll tell you what, Blake Burke, it was, it's three games. I get it. Uh, we, we need to see a little bit more, you know, action here in the season. But Blake Burke has improved tremendously defensively at first base. You know, last year, well, not very good, point blank in the field. He has improved tremendously, and you can see that through three games um, here this weekend. Christian Moore made a nice charging play at short, throw on the run, getting a guy out in a crucial spot late in that game against Oklahoma. Billy Amick in the first inning against Oklahoma ranging to his right, throwing off balance across the diamond, getting the out of first base. Hunter Inslee, three times this weekend, making, I guess against Baylor, it was more of a diving catch, but two catches over the shoulder at the warning track against Oklahoma. Dylan Drawling, a nice diving catch in left field against Oklahoma before. Uh, you know, his mishap there in the 10th inning that I think he would tell everybody that he probably should have caught against Oklahoma. Point being, yeah, Tennessee was flashing the leather. Oh, yeah, and then two plays at the plate against the Sooners, and you know Blake Burke throwing it to one to Charlie Taylor with a, or to Cal Stark with a beautiful tag, and then the second time to Charlie Taylor the plate to cut down a run. 
Tennessee played some really good defense this weekend. And you're right. In, in years past, in 2022, you had the base running blunders or maybe some errors defensively. They were overshadowed because you were scoring 12 runs a game. In 2023, those were magnified because you struggled throughout the first portion of the season. Um, let's see what the st- what the story hits here in 2024 consistently on offense, but it looks like defense through the first weekend much, much improved, and that was really fun to watch. All right, at the plate, we saw this team, you know, and you're going to have, unfortunately, you're going to have some base when you leave runners on base. You can't get that timely hit, and that was the Oklahoma game. But but overall, this team, again, flashes power. Um, I think the question is going to be, you know, can they – you know, can they score, manufacture a bunch of runs, right? Can, can they close and, and and get that critical hit when they have to have it? I mean, it, it's three games in, and it's not to say that they can't. What, what is your takeaway from this offense other than it looks like they're going to be able to hit the long ball yet again this year? Because that's a big part they hit the long ball in, and they hit it pretty doggone well. Yeah, and um, Kavar's tears was – he needed one more foot, <laughs> I guess, to, to have a, his second home run Sunday night. He he had the 409 feet when uh, the park was 410 at you know where he was. Thought Cannon Peebles missed a home run that would have been a, a home run at Lindsey Nelson Stadium. Christian Moore missed a home run that would have been a home run at Lindsey Nelson Stadium. So there were a lot of home runs this weekend. There would have been even more if you were playing at home. So I think the long ball is going to be alive and well. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Christian Moore was saying it after the game on Sunday night. He, you, know, you can't go over three on the weekend with the bases loaded. You know, you, you got to work on that. You got to cash in some runs there. And, and Tennessee needs to do a better job of not leaving runners left on base. Um, but I, Christian Moore is just a hitter. He had over 400 on the weekend. He had multiple, he had a couple of doubles there on Sunday night. He had multiple extra base hits. Billy Amick, he had a, he had a tough Saturday, but boy, he was phenomenal on, on Friday and on Sunday and just the, the exit velocity off his bat's incredible. Kavar's tears, I thought, really re- rebounded on Sunday. It was a tough day for him at the plate on Friday, though he did get on twice and score two runs. He struck out a couple of times, and again, it was, it was a huge reason for Tennessee's success on Sunday. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just think that competitive at bats, w- what I liked a little bit throughout the weekend, like I'll give Hunter Inslee an example from Friday, was 0 for 4, his fifth time at the at the plate, gets a single. Uh, Blake Burke, he was 0 for 3 on, gets a little bloop single, if you want to call it that, and then, you know, probably should have been caught, but he goes down as a single in the book. His next AB, he has a nice base hit to right field. It feels like once that first domino kind of falls, it, it allows them to to take some pressure off themselves and, and just to go to work a little bit. So um, I, I think offensively, it's very balanced. I think it's going to be a power hitting lineup, and uh, we'll see how it continues to evolve. But opening weekend, you thought Christian Moore would be good. He was great. Billy Amick was great. Cannon Peebles was much better at the plate than his stats would indicate. He'll continue to come around, and um, you know we'll, we'll see again how this team kind of evolves over the next couple of seasons, so or the next couple of weeks. But I think opening weekend, a lot of positives, way more positives than I would have negatives here from Dallas. All right, the last couple of things for me from a pitching standpoint. A lot of bodies. They threw a lot of arms. You know, obviously, they were trying to be careful with pitch count early in the year. What is your takeaway in, in two areas? One, overall depth of this pitching staff in seeing the newcomers in live action against not their teammates. And two, that that third starter. What, where do you think that is right now? How open is that going to be? How long is it going to be before they get settled there? Is that going to be a by committee type thing? What do you envision out of the third starter? And what's your overall take on the pitching depth of this team? Yeah, I think overall on the weekend, I like the pitching. Um, you know, Nate Snead struggled in his first inning out of the bullpen yesterday, Sunday, and um, yeah, he walked three, but went on to pitch, you know, five innings and and, and looked really good. Um, Xander struggled on Sunday. I think Drew Beam was not nearly his best, but when it was all said and done, and he can thank a lot of the defensive plays behind him, but Drew Beam went five and two thirds, gave up seven hits, only one extra base hit, and, and you know, his stat line was fine. Um, AJ Russell was. Phew, you know, the, the AJ show on Friday night wrote about it. It's It was really strong. So I think overall on the weekend, Tennessee's pitching was good. Now, um, it will continue again to evolve. We'll see how Tony and, and Frank Anderson want to use these guys in the bullpen and kind of the roles that they will start to pick up. We just don't have those answers right now. I think as, as, as far as the third starter, it's wide open. Um, 
You know, Xander Seacrest certainly going to get more chances. I don't know if he'll get the start Sunday, but I mean, it's not like he's never going to pitch again. Um, he was not great against Baylor to begin things out. I think but when it's all said and done, you'll have a freshman that'll be that starter, whether it's Derek Schaefer or Matthew Dallas. And I could see one of those two getting one of the midweek starts this week. And then Austin Humley probably getting the second midweek start. Um, but we'll we'll continue to see a little bit as, um, you know, Tony Vitello said that he was going to ease Marcus Phillips into action. He was the first guy out of the bullpen on Saturday, <laughs> you know. Um, Chris Stamos was was thrown in there twice this weekend. Um, A.J. Causey and Nate Sneed went, you know, multiple innings. Um, some guys didn't even pitch. So I, think, I would say Tennessee continues to have some depth. I like the depth in the back end of the bullpen. Just need to, as the season goes along, we'll see exactly kind of how they want to utilize these guys. And um, as far as, again, third starter, it's open, and, and we'll see. I could see it being um, – by committee here for a little bit, piggyback starts like it essentially was on Sunday, uh, bullpen games. But the goal is to have that figured out by SEC play. Sure. It's yep. not going to be figured out by this Sunday. It's not going to be figured out by next Sunday. But by SEC play, you hope to have a plan on what direction you want to go in on Sundays. And again, I, I still think it's going to be a freshman, either Derek Schaefer or Matthew Dallas. All right, my last question. Tony Vitello leaving the weekend. Frank Anderson, that whole coaching staff, has – a to-do list uh, that's pretty long. What do you think sets atop that to-do to-do list uh, after they've had a chance to see this team in a competitive environment uh, where there's a crowd, it's a regional-type atmosphere in some games, they got into a high-scoring game, they got into a low-scoring game, they had to come back, all those types of things. What is t- what's the priority list for Tony Vitello as his team returns to Knoxville? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I still I think the the top thing on that list is going to be, you know, hitting with runners on. You, you can't leave so many ducks on the pond like Tennessee did um, against Oklahoma. Ten men on base, left five men on base throughout the first two innings with five strikeouts. Again, you were 0 for 3 with the bases loaded on the weekend. You fail to come across in those type of situations. You're going to fail to beat some of these big teams, these ranked teams in the Southeastern Conference. And so... That's number one on the to-do list, hitting with runners in scoring position, hitting with runners on. Um, I think from a pitching standpoint, a little erratic at times. And again, that, it's opening weekend. Right. Um, you're throwing in a big league park. You're coming in the ball game, throwing 100 miles an hour and runners on base if you're Nate Snead. I mean, the adrenaline's going a little bit, but um, I, I do think that the control at times a bit erratic. The walks may be a little high for some of these relievers. And so I think just, you know, just the basic – control and you know pitch selection and how you go about attacking some hitters um, is something to work on. I thought Tennessee controlled the run game, kind of a sidebar. I think Tennessee controlled the run game very well this weekend on the base pass. Um, you know, pitchers throwing over to the first base. Cal Stark was really good behind the play throughout two base runners against Oklahoma. That's something Tennessee hasn't done in years past. And in opening weekend, they did a good job in that regard. So, um, again, it's uh, it's going to be a, a work in progress. Tennessee's never going to be perfect on the season, but uh, I think it was a good start after opening weekend and, and some really good competition, at least Friday and Saturday here at the Shriner Showdown. Well, it was certainly fun to follow uh, with you in the game thread on VolQuest and all your coverage this weekend. Uh, in Dallas. So I know all the VolQuest subscribers are thankful for that. If you're not a subscriber, you missed out on a ton of baseball coverage this weekend, some great features, obviously minute by minute, second by second updates on everything that was going on, observations, all the stuff from Eric this weekend in Dallas. If you missed out, you missed out on a lot of baseball coverage. We'll continue to have plenty of that throughout this week and moving forward as baseball season is here. That's going to do it for this edition of the VolQuest.com podcast presented by our good friends at Exterior Home Solutions. For Eric Kane, Austin Price, Grant Ramey, and Rob Lewis, I am Brent Hubbs. Have a great rest of your Tuesday, everybody. 